an excavator, a tunnel boring machine. The diesel engine was invented around the end of the 1800s and Rudolf Diesel was the inventor, thus the name Diesel. It's basically an internal combustion engine thermal conversion device which converts thermal energy into mechanical energy. Originally, that diesel engine that he invented, he wanted it to run on soybean oil, which is basically a renewable fuel, a biofuel. And then there's no spark plug to ignite it, unlike in a gasoline spark ignition engine. And it's the compression of the piston in the cylinder that generates enough heat to cause the fuel to explode. Everything that's a heavy-duty piece of equipment or heavy-duty truck or diesel. Diesel engines transport about 94% of the, all the freight in this country. They're durable and reliable and powerful and they actually save people money. So that's why most businesses use diesel engines versus gas engines because they have a lot lower maintenance cost and they last a long time. The diesel is the workhorse of, of our industry for sure. Diesel exhaust is a complex mixture of gases and particles. There's at least 40 elements within that mix that are known to be or suspected to be human carcinogens. Things like benzene and formaldehyde and one butadiene and other chemical compounds. Diesel emissions contain particulate matter that is very small in size. It's a source of fine particulate that 95% is less than one micron and a human hair is 75 microns in diameter. Those little particles go down deep into your lungs and don't ever come back out again. Particulate matter is really, it's a far bigger deal, I think, than anybody ever thought. There's all sorts of defenses that you have to filter out those larger particles. But with the fine particles, they evade all of those natural systems and end up in the tiny air sacs um, way down in your lungs where they don't really come out and they can do, you know, permanent tissue damage and, and cause a whole other variety of problems. And to make it worse, there are a lot of toxic parts of diesel that absorb onto the surface of those particles. And so you're not only getting just fine particulate matter that's, that's clean, but it has these little toxic components that hitchhike onto it and attach to the particulate, and that goes in your lungs as well. It's much more hazardous than a lot of other types of pollution. The risk for diesel, as I say, really comes from the utility of the engine. That while you may be in remote areas where the air is relatively clean, but diesels tend to be where you are. And people live near highways and they use diesels for hauling their garbage, for moving them from one place to another, for, for hauling goods, for moving freight. Diesels tend to be where people are, regardless of whether you're in an urban area or a rural area. The concentrations tend to be much higher in the urban areas, but not necessarily that low in the rural areas where it just becomes something that can be completely ignored. And we have now the technology in hand to make these engines as clean as anywhere in the world, much less any other engine that's out there. Lung cancer is it's a serious disease. Part of why it's so serious is that early detection is really hard. A summary of some studies was saying that diesel was associated on average with a 40% increased relative risk for lung cancer. There's one fairly famous study that really got me going. It's called No Breathing in the Isles. You know, they measured diesel exhaust in school buses. The 
levels that they found inside the bus were eight to ten times higher than they found behind the bus. Which is, of course, really dangerous, especially for children, as their lungs are still developing, their, all their vital organs are still developing. They're taking in more air per pound for their body size than an adult would be taking in. So they're interacting with that pollution a lot more than an adult is interacting with that pollution. In California, they determined that there's an elevated risk for cancer just from riding a school bus from K through 12, you know, back and forth to school, that increased risk for cancer on the order of about 4% as opposed to not riding the bus. But there's also, frankly, there's an increased risk for asthma as well. Once you have asthma, you always have asthma. It's a disease where the airways become suddenly inflamed and constricted. Here's a nice, healthy airway. It's light pink. There's, there's lots of room here. I can easily stick my finger in there. It's, it looks really healthy and good. In comparison, here's what an airway in the middle of an asthma attack would look like. It gets really inflamed and irritated. It fills with mucus. And along with this airway constrict, constriction is a, kind of a tightening of muscles as well. And so, you know, depending on the severity of the asthma for people, it, it can be mild discomfort or it can be turning blue and not, not at all being able to take in a breath. Burning a cleaner fuel and burning a fuel cleaner. And the cleaner fuel is typically an ultra low sulfur diesel fuel which has very, very low sulfur contamination in it. Sulfur prevents the installation of these advanced pollution control devices because the sulfur poisons the catalyst in these units, making them worthless. So by taking the sulfur out, we can now start installing these advanced technologies that have been kind of like on automobiles for a number of years. just a number of vehicles out there right now that are running engines that when they were made were, you know, met the standards. But there's definitely cleaner technology available and there's ways to make them cleaner. The particulate filter will reduce about 95 percent of the particulate emissions out of the exhaust stream. So it's really the cleanest thing uh, to put on the engine. Well, customer will probably look at doing retrofit. The larger customers will do uh, equipment trade out. They'll buy new engines that meet the standard, but then the old equipment floats down to the next tier of user because it doesn't just get destroyed, it gets moved out of that big customer's fleet and down into the eventually maybe the farmer hauling his produce to market. The retrofit devices generally are being added to the old legacy fleet or older engines that aren't quite as clean as those that are currently in production. So the retrofit is really out there for the small business to uh, meet emission standards, to make their engines cleaner, to, you know, depending on what they're doing, to make their customers and their employees happier. Particulate trap can be used on piece of construction equipment and other off-road sources of diesel, as well as on older trucks that aren't built to the new specs or school buses can be retrofitted with these particulate traps. Really the device, as long as they're fueled correctly and operated correctly, they'll last the life of the vehicle and, and be able to be used on other vehicles because they are virtually indestructible. Diesel exhaust causes increased incidence of health problems. So we want to try to minimize it as much as possible and we have the solutions. I mean diesel particulate filters will reduce diesel emissions by 95 percent. We just need the money. One of the other strategies we're looking at at cleaning up diesel engines has to do with idling. There's certainly 
not quite an old wives, maybe an old trucker's tale about you need to leave the engine running all the time, it's bad to turn it off. And in fact, I've heard of one guy who was proudly said that from the time he bought his truck to the time he sold it, he never turned it off. So even though he'd be home on the weekends, it'd be running all the time. The technology on these diesel engines have improved such that that's really no longer the case. You really need to shut them down. In fact, you're wasting fuel and, and costing yourself money by keeping these engines running. But in some circumstances, it's really challenging to find an alternative. For instance, look, look at these long-haul truck drivers. Some of these guys are on the road for three weeks at a time, and they, make, they don't make very much money, so they can't afford to stay in motels, so they live in their truck. And it's really not reasonable for us to tell him to not idle his truck to run his air conditioner when he's sitting in 110 degree heat somewhere. Or he's conversely to run his heater when he's sitting in a place where it's getting down below freezing. The anti-idling truck project we call Everybody Wins. What we did, we borrowed money from the Department of Energy, the Oregon Department of Energy, and we go ahead and buy anti-idling devices and finance them to the trucking industry through a long-term lease. So uh, owner-operators and small fleets is mostly um, what we've done so far. The program is outlined with a goal of 100 APUs to be installed, and it requires no money down, allows the operators to enter into a, uh, a money-saving situation as soon as that APU is on their truck. The APU has just made the job so much easier, so much more comfortable. We have a constant temperature thermostat control when the truck's parked. Every day we shut the truck off and start the, the APU, the Pro Heat, why it's putting money back in our pocket. Plus it's saving the environment, it's saving less fuel. Instead of burning a gallon and a half of fuel an hour, we're burning a pint. It actually saves three to four hundred dollars a month in fuel, and the average price is about one hundred sixty dollars a month for a unit. So they're in a good, better position from day one, and we are encouraging the use of the addition of a shore power connection as well. trucks that idle at truck stops, we can electrify the truck parking spaces. So like the RVs and the campers that pull into a camping space in an RV and plug into the, to the grid to provide electricity for all that power, we can electrify the truck stops to provide that same kind of service capability. Basically you'll have uh, these pedestals at a number of different parking facilities, uh, mostly truck stops. However, we can also install them at travel plazas, rest areas fleet terminal sites, warehouses, basically anywhere a truck would park. And once you have the connections, you can simply run your extension cord into the cab and power any device you would power at your home. Now the truckers have really responded positively to it because they get to save money on their fuel, they get to save money on the wear and tear in their truck, they get a quieter night's sleep, they're not sitting in a truck that's rattling all night long, and it's great for the environment too. Once you have the ground-based infrastructure, you can power whatever is electric capable. And you don't necessarily have to have one of these type of shore power pedestals. You can plug in at your warehouse where there might be existing outdoor receptacles. So it's, it's very flexible in that sense. Um, Even considering the amount of effort and energy it takes to generate electricity at a remote plant and send it over the grid, it's still 90% more efficient to generate the, the energy that way than by running the truck engine and the emissions are dropped by virtually that much as well. It's fairly typical that long-haul heavy-duty trucks consume about a gallon of fuel an hour at idle, so these trucks are saving, or, or the fleets or the, the owner-operators are saving a gallon worth of fuel every hour. School buses are really the safest way to get kids to school we're just interested in making them also the cleanest way to get kids to school, too. EPA has developed a special program for school buses called Clean School Bus USA. And what they do is they offer information in that program about what technologies will work for school buses, but they also provide grant funding. You could take a look at the soot 
that was in the pipe. It just doesn't take much. Just touch the end of it, and this is the kind of soot that comes out. If we had a bus with a particulate filter installed here after it had come off of a run, took a look at the pipe, you would find out that you could draw your finger and you wouldn't get that soot. What you would get is rust. We were able to pioneer with them about getting filters installed on 13 of their school buses, and they've been running those buses very successfully for the past year. There's children riding on these buses. We certainly want a healthy environment for them. A school bus is the safest thing on the road. Why not do our part to clean up the exhaust as well? Back in about 2001, DEQ approached us and told us about uh, these new uh, diesel particulate filters that you could use in conjunction with the ultra-low sulfur diesel fuel that would drastically clean up the air. So we have two transfer stations that uh, we own. We looked at the air emissions in the transfer stations and uh, we looked at the, the heavy equipment that our contractor uses in there and saw that uh, they contribute a lot of pollution within the building. And so we were looking for ways where we could clean up the environment for our customers uh, and our, uh, our employees. The contract was up in 2005. We thought it was a good opportunity for us to see if we could get our contractor to purchase a new heavy equipment that would be state-of-the-art in terms of emission control devices. The winning proposer, they offered what we call diesel particulate filters and diesel oxidation catalysts to use on all their rolling stock in conjunction with using ultra-low sulfur diesel fuel. The contractors in the past have used about 100,000 gallons of, of low sulfur diesel fuel that they burn in a year in our two transfer stations. So by using uh, the ultra-low sulfur diesel fuel, it can significantly clean up the air in our transfer stations. To solve this problem, we need to begin acting now. That delaying it really just means that there's another, another impact that happens. In fact, we've done an estimate that says that the annual cost of the impact of exposure to diesel exhaust is on the order of $2.3 billion a year in Oregon alone. By taking action now, we can start reducing those impacts while still retaining the advantages of diesels. for the grandkids, you know. It's their world that we're giving to them, you know. <laughs>